I'm very excited about my new friend that is on my podcast today. And she grew up in Johannesburg. She left in 1995 to attend B School and embark on a career on Wall Street, investing in public and private companies. She finally saw the light in 2017 and became a dental entrepreneur, or as we like to say, she became a do, a dental entrepreneur woman. After a few years at Henry Schein's Innovation Center, she honed her entrepreneurial chops at Jarvis Analytics and now at Plan Forward. Now Africa is calling and she's planning to scale Kilimanjaro in the spring. Please help me welcome the, the brave and fierce Jane Levy. Hey, Jane. Hey, Anne. Lovely to be here. It's so nice to have you. I, we're so excited because you debuted yourself in our Dental Entrepreneur, The Future of Dentistry. And um, it just reached my mailbox. And I'm glad it got to your mailbox as well. I was, I was really loving this edition. It's so yummy. And um, for all of you that are listening Today, you can go on our website, dentalentrepreneur.com, and find Jane's article along with all the other articles in, in this edition. And, um, you know, we just ask people to share what's going on in their businesses and, and how we can support our industry and the industry that we, we really love. And, you know, with Jane, I mean, Jane, so you came over, I mean, B school, what made you want to go to B school? Uh, great question. So, growing up in South Africa, uh, we we knew that things were um, changing very rapidly. And, uh, you know, I had family members that had left the country. I knew that um, that was probably the path for me, that I didn't want to stay um, in South Africa. And um, and I thought that I would have many more opportunities if I left the country. And um, so I thought the best way to do that and to integrate myself in a new country was to attend uh, school or attend college um, or, you know, in my case, business school um, in the, in, you know, my new country. And so that's, that was my path um, into the US. Uh, and it was a good one because I certainly made a lot of contacts. I, um, I, you know, found a job obviously after business school in New York City. And so it really helped me kind of launch my new, my new life in the US. Wow. Where did you go to B school? I went to B school at MIT Sloan, um, and uh, what? what? Yeah, hello. Yep. Oh my gosh, you're such smarty pants. That's amazing. It Jeez. was amazing. Uh, you wow. know, I, I had always loved technology. Had started my career as a programmer, and um, just saw the transformational effect of technology, and knew that I was also very entrepreneurial. And so it was the ideal place for me because it offered, you know, kind of an entree to both. And actually, when I started my career on Wall Street, I covered technology companies, uh, which was fabulous and a fun time to do it because it was during the dot-com boom and then bust. Yes. Wow. That's when it all just started happening. I mean, that's, I mean, I was thinking 1995, that's not that long. That's not that long ago. I mean, you know, it just feels like to me, things were just getting started, but that the bust then was right then as well, but just to see people just go all the way up the mountain. Let's talk about Kilimanjaro. I mean, they go up the mountain and they just kind of fell off the cliff that it, at some point. But to be involved in that, you learn so much, right? I mean, gosh, so the good, the bad, and the ugly. 100%. And actually, uh, I remember so many companies coming public and some were even pre-revenue. They didn't even have any revenue. It was just a concept at the time. Uh, and it was a very formative time of my career uh, when I had to you know, spend time sorting through and researching these extremely young companies that, um, and, and really try and find the ones that were investable, even though there was no revenue and barely, barely a product. And that's really what got me kind of like hooked on the whole entrepreneurship journey. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's, and that's what I've done, you know, since 95 really is just focus on uh, how to essentially grow grow companies and and find companies that um that that have a path um to to profitability or to an exit. Yeah, that is so cool. So yeah, we should talk because you know, I think if you're an entrepreneur and you're building a company, you you really have to have the mindset that you want to scale it and sell it sometime because as entrepreneurs, I could speak for myself, most of the money that we make 
we pull back into the company. And so at the end of, it's not like working for somebody and you've got this nice 401k because, well, frankly, like my husband had a lovely 401k and, um, and then when he was about 42, decided to start his own company. So great, we'll be millionaires, but then, you know, guess what? It's not that easy. And so then you start sifting out your, your money and your riches and you put them into your, into your business because if you're, if you're like my husband, you have belief in what you're doing and you just can't quit. And so I think that is really interesting to be able to actually own the fact that you can come in and help someone scale to the point where somebody else thinks, sees the value and will buy it because of that kind of makes everybody whole again and, and, um, and makes your dream a reality so that your, and, and your family members say, well, oh, now I get it. Okay, now I get it. Good job, right? Because so often you don't have a lot of support you know, around you when you're, when you're, you know, as the entrepreneur, you know, do you see it as a roller coaster, Jane? Cause I I've seen it as a roller coaster. How do you see entrepreneurship? <laughs> it's a great point. I mean, entrepreneurship is a grind. It really is. And it <laughs> requires grit beyond measure. Uh, I will say that, um, totally agree with what you, what you laid out. Um, you know, as I think about, uh, you know, the, the journey of being an entrepreneur and bringing an idea to life and then, growing that idea, um, you know, you think of any space, even, you know, let's say artificial intelligence in dentistry, um, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, five, six, seven years ago, it was a brand new idea. Uh, and now look how competitive that space is. So it's extremely hard to maintain a moat um, as a company and, uh, and to transition a company through the different phases of growth um, and, you know, and, dif- you know, different parts of its life cycle. And uh, it's all our dream to grow a big company and to grow a multi-billion dollar company that goes public ultimately. But uh, the real- the reality is that it's extremely hard to do. And so um, sometimes uh, the-, the best way to unlock value, both for, in- you know, if you've taken outside investors' money or even for yourself as the entrepreneur is to merge with another company. And to exit, uh, you know, sometimes earlier than you wish, but uh, but certainly, uh, you know, that journey is a hard one. Uh, I do want to say that that is actually how I got into dental. Uh, I had no intention of of uh, you know moving out of technology, but um, I read an article uh, back in probably 2015, 2016, um, and it was about um, venture capital um, going into dentistry. And at the time, um, I think in 2015, in fact, I have the the report in front of me, I pulled it up. Um, In 2015, $15 million had been invested in dental products and services. And that increased in 2016 to 95 million. In particular, there were two companies that were funded in 2016. There were Sonendo and Convergent Dental. And and that really piqued my interest. Um, And I you know, started to look deeper into dental because that that growth rate was exceptional, um, far faster than than any other space in healthcare, and uh, so that's when I I became interested in in dental. And um, the funny story is that uh, I lived in the same building as Stan Bergman, and uh, we were working together on a fund to raise money for our undergraduate university in South Africa called the University of the Witwatersrand. And uh, and in the course of some of those conversations, I said to him, you know, I noticed this trend, this huge investment bubble going into dental and uh, and asked whether Henry Schein had a, a venture fund or something, you know, along those lines where they were getting exposure to this, to this, you know, this clearly huge growth in dental. And uh, and that's when, you know, he said, well, why don't you come and, and work in our innovation group and, you know, and and let's study the market together. And that's how I got into dental. Oh my gosh, that's such a great story. Wow. And then was Jarvis Analytics already something? And then you just came in and worked with when the in that uh you know that lane? Yeah, exactly. So so actually in 2019, so I joined Henry Schein in 2017. A couple of years later, in 2019, we did a deep dive into uh membership plans. And that's when I met Megan at Plan Forward for the first time. But that aside, uh, back to Jarvis, Jarvis was one of the companies that I came across and thought, you know, was doing some exceptional work. Uh, And so um, when COVID hit and Shine kind of stopped doing deals, 
and uh, and obviously everybody was sent home for an indefinite period. Um, I left Shine and joined Jarvis uh, as chief growth officer uh, to help them scale the business, and and um, and that was a fun time too. That was also a roller coaster because within a year we had sold that company to Shine. Wow! Yeah. Oh man, that is fun. Mm. And so you're an expert in that, and so no wonder that um, Megan just saw something in you and had been, you know, been friends, I guess, or knew each other. And sh- did she reach out to you and say, hey, I need help. Come come work with us? Uh, good question. And so actually, um, so, so when I, when we had sold Jarvis, I, uh, I um, started to ramp up my work with Jeremy Krell at uh, Revere. Uh, and um, as you know, Revere is very focused on um, the oral space and um, investing in early stage oral companies. And uh, as part of my work with Revere, I reached back out to Megan thinking, you know, maybe membership plans are a good place to invest. And uh, we reconnected and uh, discovered that we have a lot of um, overlap in terms of the va- our values and the way we, we think about the world. But um, certainly in terms of our skill set, we're very complementary. And uh, and so that's when we started figuring out that actually we we love talking to each other. And Meg um, hopped on a plane and came to Manhattan uh, for lunch. And um, and when we met in person, we realized um, this was definitely something we could we could contemplate uh, working together and you know really scaling the business. Wow, that's that is just really cool. And so it's female owned, and it's and it's growing. Yeah. And the energy, because oh, I was at ADOM and your booth had so much energy. And of course, you've got Janelle Stork and she's just such an, an integrator and a st- strategist and, you know, executor, right? Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet, a bet, a bet against the three of you for anything in the whole world. You guys are going to just do it. And it's so neat because I think membership plans, they are they are just emerging and it's only been a couple of years, I think, since since actually it, it's gotten to the level like you actually got some competition in a sense. But competition is great because we it helps everybody understand that that this is something we need. Right. I, I, I keep thinking, why don't we have I can't wait for some big company to put something on 60 Minutes and um, as a commercial for membership plans for dentistry, because everybody the more I read about it, and your article is so great in Dental Entrepreneur. Again, everybody check it out. It's on our website. Why you need a membership plan and why it's great for the business and why it's great for retention and it's great for your patients and everybody wins and everybody gets care. And I, I just, it's, it's like a no brainer, Jane. And they just emerged. I don't know. When was the first membership plan even started? Yeah, so Meg will tell you that they've been around a long time, actually. Probably, yeah, probably, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and a lot of practices that we come across actually have membership plans, but they're running them internally. Uh, and I think this is the key The key point. The key point is that um, if you think of a um, kind of a, a bell-shaped curve and where we are in terms of adoption of membership plans, we're really at the beginning stages of the mainstream market. And that's that's the stage at which, um, you know, practices are looking for productivity improvement. So these are, um, you know, generally speaking, these are not necessarily early adopters because we're we're kind of in the later stage of, of, of early adoption, but these are the pragmatists, the folks that that want, understand the value of the membership plan. And, um, and so we're definitely reorienting the business to focus on, you know, how members, member, the membership software can be used as a strategic tool, and how um, practices can uh, understand better the value of their cash patients, and vis-a-vis certainly those that uh, th- those are those um, insured patients, um, and the way that insured patients behave versus how their cash patients behave, uh, and. You know, we feel that we have the the wind at our backs in terms of the trend away from insurance, and the fact that uh, you know payers, unfortunately, many of them have not renegotiated reimbursement for fifteen years or so, and so um, for practices that are still uh, getting reimbursed at rates, you know, uh, from from way back when, 
um, uh, being in network is no longer an option. And, uh, you know, but certainly they want to make decisions to move out of network in a very informed way. And that's where a platform like ours can help them because they can they can get access to data around the behavior of their, their cash patients, their membership patients, their discount patients, and ultimately also their patients um, who are insured and do an, a side-by-side -side assessment to see what's best for their practice. Mm. Okay, that's... Well, that's key because they need that kind of data to, to be able to more invest in it and take the time and effort that it means to, to enroll all their patients, right? They need, a, they need a reason for it. They need to have some belief in it. And as dentists are such uh, analytics, you know, they need that, that just to, uh, you know, share with their team because it's got to be a team effort when you have people coming in and introducing this to uh, their patients. And I just love your, you know, we, I, you've got a little fur baby I hear over there. He's, is he, 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 he wants to be on the, um, on the webinar on the or the, podcast on the podcast too. as well. I just love it. Welcome. Sorry all, everyone's that. welcome. Everyone's welcome here. Great. I love that. Well, you'll be happy to know she, she, it's Stella. She's a dude. Oh, Stella, she's a do. Oh, mm -hmm. she is. She's a woman and she happens to be in dentistry. She's a do. That's right. It's perfect. Say. Isn't that so great? Oh my gosh. Well, the thing about also with the the um the membership plans is that you know you were mentioning in your article that the retention and they come back and they take more treatment like you're when you were giving the statistics which is really cool and I just did a podcast with Tom Snyder who I you know do you know Tom from Henry Shine do you know I Tom don't. well mm -hmm. he was he's in transitions with Henry Shine he just he did an article in this edition as well and he is a big statistic guy. He's like given all these statistics. And you gave a lot of statistics in your article as well. And by the time I was finished with reading it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is I got to shout from the rooftops that if you don't have a membership plan, you're crazy because right. it really makes so much sense. And like you said, the wind is in your, the bat, in your back because I don't know one office that is happy that they have to deal with insurance. Right. It's, it's just a time suck. For the for everybody, and they have to hire it out now, and this is just makes perfect sense. I mean, I, and I can even relate to my daughter who, you know, she always had, you know, uh, mama as a dental hygienist working, so she doesn't even know what it's like to pay for her own dental care because it was always free, right? And so when she, you know, got her first uh, gig, and and she bought her, she had her own business, and so she bought dental insurance, and it didn't cover anything, and she was shocked at it, and. You know, we knew that. And I tried to say, Kate, I don't really think you need this. This is not something you need. But nobody, the real world doesn't still understand how valuable this opportunity is to be um, in the membership plan, have the regular appointments, know that the dentist has your back, get the discount, and you don't have to worry about all this other stuff and you're not using. It's, just, it's just unbelievable how the, the uh, insurance companies, I mean, you know, they have really fooled America. <laughs> into thinking that it's a good thing and that everybody needs it. And in, in, in reality, this is just an answer to that pain point. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, this, and the shocking stats are that if there are 100 million uninsured Americans, um, adults at least, um, 40 million still see the dentist. And so those 40 million are coming in and paying cash um, for, their, for their treatment, for their preventative care. And um, it's just not affordable um, and certainly not affordable to come in twice a year, which, as you know, is the standard of care, according to the ADA. Uh, so there is also 60 million who are not even coming into the dentist. And um, and Plan Forward certainly see, wants to address both those segments of the market. Um, 40, those 40 million that are coming into the dentist obviously can be um, reached through the dental practice. But those um, 60 million who are not even coming into the practice uh, can be, you know, can we can get to them through the employers, and uh, it's it's the one of the biggest, um, you know, small medium businesses with less than fifty employees. Uh, very few of them actually offer dental as a benefit, and yet it's it's um, one of the most sought after benefits. So um, membership plans can be a great way for um, those employees, especially gig workers, part time workers, um, and those who are cost sensitive to access oral care. Oh, yeah. You just said something that struck me. Now, if you have a small business, 
Yeah. Would it behoove you as a small business to say to all everyone that's working for you, we're going to enroll you in this membership plan? Do you, does that happen then? I, I was thinking, I'm thinking one-on-one. I didn't catch that. So that that's a great perk um, for your employees, which really is uh, affordable. And it's just a thank you. And it's like, again, it, hope, it helps. That's, that's a, yeah, I could, I could sell that um, just to small businesses because it's something that you can give to your employees and that it holds them like, boy, I, I work for a great company. I can't leave because I actually have this dental plan and it's really not, um, it's a one, it's a, it's a, um, it's a monthly fee, but you know, everyone is used to that now. I mean, again, the wind at your back. I mean, this has been going, you've had it for a long time, but now it just seems normal that everybody has a, uh, you, you have a dental membership plan now. Yes, absolutely. No, it is. It is. It's, um, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a slam dunk because the employer can subsidize just like they do with insurance. They can pay part of the uh, membership fee or they can pay the entire fee. Uh, or they could even allow the employee to choose uh, their provider and therefore the membership plan, and they could reimburse them after the fact. So there's many different ways that the employer can help the employee to pay for this benefit. Uh, it doesn't, you know, the the old way of paying for uh, someone's insurance, you know, uh, is is kind of uh, of the past. There are many employers that are self-insuring these days. And so membership plans are becoming one more attractive for those types of employers. Well, there's another thing there too, though. It, you know, it's great when you have your employer, you know, give you that benefit. But I also feel like people need skin in the game. And that's the other thing I like about the membership plan is like, if you're paying so much a year, you're going to go to the dentist. And that was something else you mentioned in your article. Like, because if you don't have insurance, you, 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 you know, at this point, especially after COVID and people are in inflation and everything, that's just way down on the bat, on the bottom of the list of things they have to do unless they have a toothache. Mm-hmm. And, but if you know you're paying for something and you get your two recare appointments a year, by golly, you're going to, you're going to go in and get those recare appointments. It's even different than having insurance from your employee in a sense. It's like you're paying for it and you take ownership in it. And I think in, in every mode of healthcare, we as, as the patient, need to take ownership in our own health. And it makes it, it just uh, works for everybody better because we take better care of ourselves that way because we own it and somebody else doesn't. Absolutely agree. And so, um, you know, so it it seems like just such a slam dunk, doesn't it? That mm-hmm. um, this is an ideal way for both the patient to access their oral care and take care of their, you know, take responsibility for taking care of their mouths and their, and their health overall, uh, as well as for the provider. It's, it's just such a great way to uh, keep those patients coming in, keep them loyal. Uh, one of our practices even said that he, you know the membership plan has allowed him to transition away from transaction-based patients to relationship patients. Oh, that's a beautiful way yeah. to say it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's loved that. So he's not filling his chair time with uh, patients that say no to every kind of treatment and who are not really invested in the health of their mouths, uh, to those that are really trusting, you know, and and take take ownership of their oral journey. Yeah, and you know, I think people in is, again following COVID, people like a community. Yeah, and so if you're in the membership of your dentist, and and there's a lot of um, um, really great relationship building tools within the plan. What what sets you apart, or where do you see the future? Uh, with Plan Forward, Jane, anything new on the horizon yeah. that you think so this, this, you're working on? Absolutely. The product is always um, morphing and changing because we work really hard to keep it fresh and to make sure that we're continuing to add value for our uh, providers. We do have a lot of new launches coming up, um, including uh, PMS integration, uh, so that we'll be able to um, integrate to almost any PMS uh, and pull the data on, on cash patients uh, into our system so that uh, we can do all kinds of reporting. Uh, as you know, we've also noticed that a lot of our practices are using Excel spreadsheets uh, to to kind of match production and collections. Uh, so we hope to do some of that on the platform too. That's that's definitely in the works. And uh, so a lot around the accounting and reporting around membership plans uh, and and really positioning the platform 
uh, to really be a strategic tool for um, a decision that's very, very important to most practices, which is to whether to stay in, in network or, or get out of network. So, uh, so I think that's how we're thinking about the future of the platform. Well, that's going to be good for everybody because then people are going to get the care they need in the time they need it and feel good about paying for it, you know, because what you don't like to hear is <laughs> my insurance doesn't cover it. I'm not going to take it. I'm, I'll, you know, just, just extract it or whatever. I mean, I just know there's so many things that, you know, just drive, drive the, the profession to a, a burnout state and just to have that um, solid yes and thank you um, from your patient, your clientele, because you've got a relationship you've built. Um, that's stronger with, with, than without it. So, you know, I, I guess you must be um, walking a lot and, um, you know, taking your steps every day because you're going to be, you know, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. I mean, come on. What, where does that come from? Is that, has that been a dream of yours for your whole life? Uh, it has been. It has been. Um, you know, I have visited Tanzania a bunch of times and every time I go, I uh, I think to myself, oh, wouldn't that be fantastic? Um, you know, I it's it's, it's quite a feat, uh, from what I understand. The altitude is really the the biggest the biggest issue, as well as um, when people ascend to the summit on that last day. I think you have to literally start climbing at midnight and climb, you know, through the night uh, in order to ascend and make it down in time. So, um, so it is a little daunting. Uh, but I've got many friends who have climbed, and uh, and. I feel like I have to, uh, I have to at least summit the the ceiling of Africa, as they call it. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of uh, the legacy that I that I wish to leave behind. Oh my gosh, that's so beautiful and exciting. And and I followed a few friends. Keith Trier is one of them. I believe he went up there, right? And so I remember following his journey. And um, gosh, I just wish you all the best. Do you have your, you have all your plans? Are you going to go by yourself or you have a team or you have people you're going with? Uh, yeah. So we've got a group that are, that are going actually some business school classmates from, from uh, Sloan. Uh, so uh, every now and again, they organize a trip up and uh, so missed the last one, but you're right. Keith, Keith is definitely one of the inspirations um, that I have, although he's a great runner. And so he's, you know, perpetually fit and, you know, probably for him, it was, it was a slam dunk. Uh, I'm not there and, uh, and I'm definitely going to have to, you know, plan forward, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how that plan forward just works. I love the name and it does. You just plan forward one step in front of the other and, and, you, and you know what? You just don't quit. That's right. That's do number, do number, or principle number nine, start and don't stop. And uh, that is wonderful. I will follow that journey and we will follow plan forward, forward. Uh, again, I love your team. You and Megan are just amazing with Janelle. That's, I mean, I know you've got a lot of other people that are working with you and you're going to see you at the retreat in November. If you, if you, if anybody's listening to this and they want a ticket, um, please, we still have some seats available in Charlotte, North Carolina, 10, 11, half day on the 12th. We're all coming together as women in dentistry to lift each other up, inspire and empower and collaborate. So, Jane, thank you. It's just been, uh, it's been lovely getting to know you. And I can't wait to see where you take Plan Forward um, in the future. And it's going to be somewhere great, I know. So thank you so much today. And thanks for all your support. Have loved getting to know you. Again, also so thrilled to have my article in the Dental Entrepreneur Magazine. And um, hope to see you at the Duke Conference for sure. You know, most of our team will be there, but I hope to make it too. That would be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. So again, check it out, dentalentrepreneur.com, the summer edition. And for all of you out there, most importantly, keep doing you. 